if there is something that I could share about conservation, it would be that there are a lot of people in the world like me who want to make a difference. And you can join us and you can be part of that and be a hero for wildlife and wild places. It's, it's extremely important. I think it's everything. Animal conservation to me personally is in incredibly important. It's one of the things that I'm most passionate about. Our goal has to be not to prevent things from going extinct, but to slow down that rate of extinction. There's a time where zoos um, didn't do as much as they could have. But that's also, you have to put it in context of that era. And so as we've moved forward in time, not every zoo, but a lot of zoos have looked at animal welfare, what's in the best interest of the animals, those sorts of things. And we've improved, and we will continue improving. At the zoo, we have the, the Columbus Zoo Conservation Fund, which helps to fund projects around the world. So from tigers to turtles to other animals around the world, the zoo is very much involved with that. So being a part of that is also very rewarding to know that from our base here in Columbus, that the zoo has a reach out all around the world to trying to assist and save corals, to saving birds, to saving amphibians, to saving large mammals. It's just amazing what can be done when people come together and focus on working in conservation and finding ways to assist uh, researchers and local people to find ways to reduce that tension, that conflict between people and wildlife. So the Columbus Zoo's mission is to lead and inspire by connecting people and wildlife. Uh, and I think zoos are, it's an interesting time right now, we're at a crossroads of defining who we are uh, and what our mission is and why do we exist. So a lot of people um, want to know why do we have these animals here, what, why, why do they exist. Historically we've done a lot with um, breeding and genetics and those types of things and having these populations, which is still really important work. Uh, the other thing though is we really need to make sure that we're engaging people in conservation and in doing work to support uh, saving these species that we have. So I see a lot of what we do is, is getting, educating and engaging people in the issues and the things that face wildlife and wild places and then um, helping to support the work and of protecting these animals. You, you must inspire awe in people. You need to give them hope because a message of doom and gloom is, is not going to encourage them to engage. So finding that way of reaching out and talking to people and finding out what interests them and what motivates them and advancing conservation. Our role is to the, the connecting and the, and the inspiration is what I look at it. So we getting people excited, um, how do we connect people and inspire them? to care about these animals, first of all. And then when they're inspired to care, what, how, how can we teach them? So why is this animal important? Um, why is its habitat important? Uh, like you look at a, an elephant. Well, that's a really big charismatic species, but there are a lot of other animals in their habitat that are also in danger. So 
um, by protecting elephant habitat, we're protecting multiple species. So what are those issues? How do we educate people? And then how do we inspire them to action? The, the, the earth is not getting any larger and yet there are more and more people on the planet. So we're all fighting for space and those vital resources. So how do we find ways to continue to share the earth with with all of the humans and all of the animals. Um, you know, humans are responsible for a lot of the issues we have. We're also the solution. And engaging people into conservation is where it's at. Partners in Conservation is focused on Mountain gorilla conservation, since there are only 880 in the entire world, we're focused on that population being so tiny. What can we do to preserve them and their habitat for future generations? In the last few months, uh, we've been receiving reports that the grower gorillas that live in eastern DRC, are the population is plummeting. And so it's estimated to be around 2,000 individuals left in the world. Being very involved with the gorilla program here at the zoo, um, it only made sense to extend that into conservation in the wild and to increase what we were doing to assist. So together the four of us started a program called Partners in Conservation to help gorillas, to help with not only tracking and monitoring gorillas, but also anti-poaching patrols to help protect them in their habitat. From there, that extended into helping people, because if people don't need to use forest resources, they're not going to go into the park. We have the opinion or the mindset that poachers are all bad and their only goal is to go into the forest to harm the animals that live there. But many people are just living hand to mouth. So they're going into the forest to get things like water, like firewood, to trap small antelopes so that their families can eat and they can be warm. So instead of vilifying them for doing that, our goal is to fund projects which will not only help gorillas but help local people. If local people have the opportunity to make their living outside of the park, they will absolutely take up that challenge every time. We work at the Nungoy National Park in Rwanda with beekeepers, beekeepers who were going into the park illegally to harvest honey using dried grasses that created sparks. Before we started our project with that national park, more than 10% of the park had been lost to accidental forest fires. Modern beekeeping methods allowed them to use smokers which keep the uh, sparks contained so that no forest fires have been started in the park by beekeepers since the program began. So by doing that, we've given them the opportunity. They're making more money than they had made before. And they're still making a livelihood benefiting the park because the bees are helping the park as well. So it's a very symbiotic relationship which is done very, very well. By working with local communities, Partners in Conservation is able to give people a livelihood outside of the park. People living there have lived with that land, with that uh, that species of animal, groups of species of animals. So they are very well aware of the park and they're very aware of the animals who live there. So they are willing to be conservationists. They are willing to uh, assist in the survival of those animals. One of the projects that we're funding is a village of highly marginalized people. So these people are some of the poorest people that, that are around. Um, they very much have nothing and they were some of the worst poachers because they had nothing. They needed 
food, they needed fire to keep their families warm at night. So what we did was we began a project and each family that agreed that they would stop going into the forest received a female pig and they were able to have that pig. They were able to uh, breed that pig and have piglets which they could sell. They had the, the manure from the pig to improve the productivity of their gardens so that they could grow more food. And so by doing that, that group of people have really been transformed. And just this past year in conversations with them and with local government representatives, they have been amazed at the turnaround in their thinking. We purchased boots for the members of this cooperative and they're actually going into the forest on joint patrols with the local park management because who better to know where snares might be and how to remove them than people that used to set snares. I made a move out to Fresno, California to be the director of the Fresno Chaffee Zoo. The general curator at the time took me on a tour of the zoo. We're walking around and we go over to their orangutan the exhibit. And the two females they had were there. And he says to me, he said, here is Saibu and here's Sarah. Well, Saibu at the time was about 15 years old. Sarah was in her 30s. And as soon as I walked in, Sarah puts her hand over her face and she starts peering through the cracks of her fingers. I had worked with both of those animals in New Orleans 14 years earlier and when I walked in the building Sarah knew exactly who I was. And, uh, and we had a very special relationship because uh, Sarah was very possessive of me. Um, and uh, whenever I would walk by the exhibit uh, on any given day, uh, if she saw me standing in the public area, she would stop whatever she was doing and she would make her way all the way up to the front of the habitat and you know and hang there and, ju and just look at it. Sarah would sit there sometimes and it was real funny because she would put her fingers through the wire and she'd hold on to my index finger and I'd just sit there and I'd talk to her and at some point she'd let go and I'd leave. Well a couple of times she, would ho she was holding on to it and I needed to go do something else and I would go to pull my finger out and if she wasn't ready, she would put just enough pressure on my finger to say, no, I'm not ready for you to go. Sarah is really special to me. Um, I, I will tell you, while I've been to Fresno a couple times since then, I've not been by to see Sarah. And the reason for that is, if I show up once every five years for 20 minutes, yes, she's gonna know me, but then is she wondering, is he ever coming back? Will I ever see him again? So. As much as I'd like to see her when I've gone to visit Fresno, it's the sort of thing, if I'm doing what's best for Sarah, I have to let go of my own personal feelings and put her well-being ahead of mine. So, so for me personally, I have a real connection to our manatee program here at the Columbus Zoo. Um, we have, uh, for uh, since 1999 had manatees here at the Columbus Zoo and when that program started um, the thing that really excited me about it was that it was a rehab release program. It's one of the only things we do here at the zoo where we actually get to see those animals come in, we work with them for multiple years, and then they get to go back out in the wild and hopefully help to kind of close that circle. And so I think for me, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk to people about, you know, we have these animals here, you get to see them, um, but when you go to Florida, think about the actions that you take. Um, Ohio has more people who visit Florida than any other state in the United States. And so sometimes people will say, well, why, why would you have manatees in the Columbus Zoo? Um, but that's a great opportunity for us to be able to talk about when you go on vacation, you're going to make choices that are going to impact this population. Well, you know, and, and I'm, I'll have to apologize, I'm going to forget the name of the game, but the game where you have all the blocks and people remove a Jenga. block. Jenga. Yeah, Jenga. That's nature in a nutshell. And you can remove a piece here can remove a piece there, but at some point you remove a piece where it all falls in. 
everything that preceded what's on the earth right now has gone extinct. And everything that is on the earth right now will go extinct. So we're never going to prevent extinction. What's important though is that what we have to work toward is finding ways to slow down the rate of extinction. Because the current rate of extinction is at a pace faster than evolution can allow for species to adapt. And, and they're disappearing faster than they can adapt or evolve into something else. Um, we had a polar bear cub born uh, at the zoo last year, Nora, uh, which a lot of people are familiar with. And we, because Nora's mom did not take care of her, we had to hand raise her. And we had some staff, very dedicated staff members who devoted enormous amounts of time to making sure that Nora not only survived, but that she thrives. I think the Columbus Zoo has, um, is unique because it is very accessible to everyone. So I think we have, have really taken Jack Hanna's lead in trying to figure out how you can make this place fun and welcoming for anyone in the community. Um, and then when they're here, we find ways to be able to, to educate and encourage conservation actions. But, um, but, but our first goal is to make sure that it's a fun, safe family environment so that people want to come and want to spend time with us with their families. Uh, in part, uh, we are entertainment. And Walt Disney said one time he would rather entertain and hope people were educated than to educate and hope people were entertained. I think um, working in the education field, we have an opportunity to really be able to um, instill hope and interest in, in students and teachers alike um, so that they are helping us to work towards conservation. Um, a lot of times people don't necessarily think about the actions they can do every day that can help to protect wildlife and wild places and so our job is to introduce them to those concepts or to take them a step further and help them figure out what they can do to make a difference. One of the biggest challenges that I see um, in education and in, in promoting conservation or doing conservation is that people um, People have really good intentions to act, but they don't always act. The more you can see, um, smell, touch um, an animal, the, the stronger that connection can be. Now that doesn't always, it's not always wise. Uh, you know, obviously we don't want people petting an a full-grown alligator, that's a bad idea, but there are ways that we can make those connections. You can read a book or watch a movie that has an elephant in it, and that's cool, and, and that's important, but if you can actually hear an elephant and you can, you can, they have a presence and you can hear them and you can smell them, like that's so much more powerful. And as much as we can do that so people can say, oh, that is amazing. These are amazing animals. How can we help them? Just don't underestimate your impact. You, your behaviors and your actions matter and you have an impact. So don't underestimate it. You, what you choose to do will make a difference. Someone recently said, you know, I don't want people to become so overwhelmed that they don't try. And I 100% believe that. Just there's a lot, but your actions do make a difference. So yeah, try, always try.